Yeah, uh, so we're live streaming. Excellent. And can you hear us speaking? So, Vlad, say, say something in Japanese so that Lukesh can check. That sounded like Bulgarian. Lukesh, did you hear it? Okay then, so I have not... Teleconferencing. <laughs> Let me try if I can hear myself. Let me try if I can hear myself. Actually, yeah, I can hear myself okay, now. Okay, then, so I've just changed things there. Excellent. So I've, we're going to have stereo. So you can, you can hear through the stream, you can hear me, Vlad. Uh, yes. Say something. Spasiba. All good? Okay. okay, all good. So we've got everyone. Uh, the video looks like 16 to 9 aspect ratio to me. Yep. Is that correct? Uh, what I'm going to do is start recording as well. And whilst we're at it, we'll go one up. and prepare Vlad's Twitter stream to show off some of his pictures. Do you mind, Vlad? Mm -hmm. Oh, damn. Uh, I absolutely do not mind. Do my marketing for me. <laughs> <laughs> You've been killing it, so definitely. Yes, you and... Others have inspired me to subscribe to Adobe and start doing photo editing. As you probably know. Well, honestly, Photoshop and Lightroom. I mean, we can do a whole podcast about <laughs> just how lovably good they are. And accessible. That's the, the key word is it makes it less scary. GIMP scares me. Photoshop is easy. I'm glad you yeah, should just do a, a YouTube channel with tutorials on photo editing and you'd kill it. Okay, um, let's get some VC people in on this. Uh, I'll be needing a couple of billion to get me started, you know, <laughs> rolling contract. Um, I think we have the, we we worked out the buzzwords to use. Uh, was it yesterday, Vlad? Yeah, might have been today. Days Mexico. kind of blur for me. <laughs> they do, but yeah, Vlad and I had this Telegram conversation where we have a whole VC pitch ready for this. Interesting. We we are both rolling live and recording, right? Yes. Okay. Then. Okay. So so, so, I, so I th th this th is this is kind of like. It's kind of like an eight at the driving song where we just start right in the middle, roll into it, no intro. I love it. Let's go. Let's go. I think um, I, I need yes. to do an intro. So, of, I'll just do a quick intro for for uh, ease of recording and actually editing, if you don't mind. So, hello everyone. Thanks for joining the Tech Travel Geeks podcast. We're having a special with our friend Vlad Savov, who's calling in all the way from Japan. Uh, we can blame Vlad Savov for the fact that we probably hasn't haven't published any podcasts in edited form on our RSS feed for about a year because of the three-hour episode that we recorded with Vlad just about a year ago. So that broke my Good will to <laughs> that broke my will to edit audio podcasts. But I think we can start start again in 2020 because. Honestly, 2020 can't get much worse than it already has been. Let's just roll with it, as we said, and invite Vlad on to talk about whatever catches his, his attention and whatever we feel like as geeks. Not much travel is happening at the moment, but we have Vlad uh, 
continuously ins inspiring us to visit Japan with his amazing street photography from Tokyo. Good evening, Vlad, or good afternoon, if you're pretending to be in the UK. Uh, I'm quite happy not pretending to be in the UK. But let, let's start with that. Let's start with the geography part of the Tech Travel Geeks. Because the geeks are here. We're present, all three of us. Uh, you're not getting video from me because it really is a choice between good audio and mediocre video, right? So let's be honest, quality over quantity. Um, I'm very happily don't have a webcam on my desktop. That means that anytime I start scratching myself or touching myself, I don't need to freak out about, oh shit, do I have like a background conference call still? functioning and happening are people looking at me so it's really reassuring honestly so number one tip from this podcast take this away don't have a webcam on your desktop um don't get an all-in-one have a nice 32 inch lg 4k monitor like me and then maybe by virtue of having that your photos will improve because mine definitely improved with this monitor now um ad hoc advertising out of the way. Like I was saying, the geeks are in place. Before we started, I was praising Lukash. I was going to ask him about his video feed because he's got his bokeh going on, this beautiful lighting. And I was going to say, hey, you know, whatever algorithm is doing this fake bokeh is really good. And then Lukash tells me, take it away, Lukash. Yeah, this is very proper, proper setup. So let me show to our viewers with the Poco F2 Pro. So we've got the GH5 with a proper, ah, it's too bright. Proper lens, proper camera, and another, uh, another light, but I can't show you really. Ah, there we go. Another light. So yeah, I've built during the quarantine, I built a nice setup for video and audio. Uh, I've got some YouTuber lights with the uh, nano leaves, which are quite cool. So yeah, it's uh, it's been a fun project, definitely. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I, I am just wowed. I'm like... The, the, if if I was going to do video and then I walked in on this year, I would have been like, oh, sorry, technical these technical flaws, and it's not going to compete. <laughs> yeah, it's always fun to join a video calls at work because I use it also at work uh, for Zoom calls. So and, um, and other bonus points, uh, you have wireless headphones. They're the latest Sony's, and you still have them wired for maximum professionalism for podcasting. Yeah. Um, I don't know what to say. Uh, you you shame us all. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Vlad, uh, if, you, if, if you were to get a webcam, I think you should get uh, Lukash's setup. Because yeah, that's the thing. I mean, if, if you're going to go, you might as well go all the way, right? Do it properly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Who would not benefit from a big chunk of Leica glass? <laughs> for sure yeah my, my Panasonic Lumix GX80 and Lumix lens uh, pales in comparison to Lukash's but I've got a bigger ring light <laughs> <laughs> well th this is this is really you know updating my um, um, knowledge I, I guess <laughs> I mean I've, I've been busy I actually have a day job which doesn't require me to be on, on camera all the time. But you guys seem to have much more time to kill and you have just fully upgraded and equipped yourselves. And you're not alone. This is the other thing. Um, a friend of mine, uh, former colleague at The Verge, Danny Deal, who's a practicing DJ, she's now a Twitch streamer and she's been tweeting about how she's fully upgraded her setup. She now has a green screen. Uh, she, you know, she's got the decks in front of her. She's got you know, various pro lights and so on and so on. Uh, I'm, I'm just like, as we mentioned before we started, our VC pitch, among our VC pitch needs to be some sort of hardware operation for uh, live streaming gear. Right, Matt? Indeed. Um, now that we 
can't travel that much. More people are using video conferencing for interacting with people. Oop, sorry. Uh, rookie mistake, I had myself muted on my microphone. <laughs> I was saying, indeed, uh, setups for video conferencing are getting more complex. People are actually making an effort nowadays because with less travel and more forced uh, video conferencing interactions, that's the way to do it. It's not just for the streamers. I mean, There's I mean Lukash is making an effort. <laughs> you you have your clothes hanging on the back of your door behind you, let's be honest. Yes, I, I, that's my hoodies and Star Wars dressing gown. This is my spare bedroom. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm totally judging you is what I'm saying. But, can, okay, can, okay. Can you see on the, topic. Can you see that box that's sitting over there? Not a box. In the corner? Oh, no, you see, I've got a bit of bouquet as well. Uh, there's a cardboard box there for, which contained a device that we recently unboxed at the Tech Travel Geeks, and Rodney has appropriated. So he sits just behind me in the box uh, when, when I allow him in the room. So fun fact, do you know where the word bokeh originates from? Is it Arabic, or have I got that wrong? It's Japanese. That was my guess, but what, what from? Uh, it's literally the Japanese word for blur. Oh, makes sense. And when I learned that, I was I was chatting with a colleague, and he talked about um, there's, there's a term in Japanese for something like old age, um, like lack of lack of mental clarity when just out of being old, uh, and the term was a compound of bokeh and something else, right? And he said, "Oh, it's this bokeh something. I forgot the something." I was like, ah, re rewind a little bit, rewind a little bit. So you're saying that in Japanese, a lack of clarity is expressed by a phrase that includes bokeh. Is that, does that have anything to do with defocusing in background in photos? It's like, yeah, it's the same thing. I was like, oh. oh. <laughs> also, okay, this is, this is much more embarrassing, but I didn't know the bass comes from Base is in like the Latin and the Italian word, and and then I was talking to someone and she told me that you know alto is high and then basso is low in Italian, and I took like five seconds. I was, oh basso low okay, then, oh 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 like bass like music. <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm supposed to be a technology expert. And also a headphones expert, among other things. And then I'm like three decades into my life before I realized where the word bass comes from. So, <laughs> so that's how we, much you need to trust me. We, we could, could start a new degree course uh, about uh, technology, terminology, etymology. Yeah, nice. And start, start looking at the roots of words and where they come from and why they're applied to technology. Because that in, in of itself will probably educate people as to how the technology itself works sometimes i mean this is the thing with tech people most of them are engineers and they don't spend too much time thinking about oblique ways of naming things right it's just uh what do we call the board that everything attaches to uh motherboard done right <laughs> uh what do we call the big ass cable that sends things in a serial fashion serial port Done. Okay. What about the one that sends them in parallel? Parallel port. Done. Uh, like a lot of this is like really good when you think about it. It's just very straight to the point. It, it's it's when, which actually okay. Since this is going to be a podcast of digressions and randomness anyway, brings me to the point about uh, Nvidia's new graphics cards because I think all three of us probably have an interest in them. And I watched that whole presentation, which included. NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang pulling a graphics card out of his oven because oh. he's doing his presentations wearing a leather jacket in his kitchen. But they're talking about RTX teraflops. And RTX is NVIDIA's ray tracing. Whereas teraflops is like number of operations, right? Floating point operations. Mm -hmm. Right? So... WTF is an RTX 
TFLOPS when like they're defining it as a, like I understand teraflops is a general purpose thing, but now they're giving us numbers of RTX teraflops. So AMD can't even complete because it doesn't even do RTX. So you literally give me a metric that you invented like yesterday. <laughs> not to me not to mention his colorful spatulas. Dude, I was like, this was the first thing I noticed. I'm like, how many spatulas does this dude need? He yeah, has yeah. one spatula per day of the month. He had a, a, a w wonderful, not bouquet, but bouquet of, of spatulas. Oof. Very good, <laughs> very good. <laughs> Applause line for Matt. I just got the 2080 Super last year, and I'm like, should I upgrade? <laughs> The 3080 looks amazing, so uh, but I don't think I'm gonna do it anytime, anytime soon. So Vlad, so uh, with your with your photography and all the wonderful work you do, and your wonderful 4K monitor, what is your desktop setup? What do you use to do your editing? Um, well, trust me to build it myself, of course, of course, of course. Um, it's an Asus motherboard. Um, I will still call it a motherboard, even though I think the official nomenclature has become degendered, de so it's main boards, but I'm old. Um, so Asus, this is the thing I start any computer with. I have had MSI main boards and fried them. I don't know if it's my fault, AMD's fault, MSI's fault. It just happens. Asus has always been super reliable. Then I build out with Corsair for the most part. So I've got a Corsair power supply unit, Corsair memory sticks, um, Intel uh, CPU. If anybody's asking for my recommendation, I'd probably direct everybody to go to AMD nowadays because their performance is really uh, not only caught up, but pushed ahead. And also I feel like AMD is really innovating and actually like progressing as a company and progressing as technology. Whereas Intel seems to be just on a complete pause, like they are lost at sea. So, like if you if you want to uh, promote better companies and reward them with your dollars, this is how like spend ethically is what I'm saying. And if you're going to spend on CPUs, do with AMD. They have a new um, logo though. What AMD? Intel or Intel? <laughs> for what for Intel proper or for like the CPU yeah. line? They changed the logo. When? Yeah. Well, it was announced yesterday or the day before during Intel's uh, launch of their 11th generation i7 chips for oh, laptops. God. So they've it got doesn't a new... have the circle. Yeah, they don't. It's just it's much simplified. Uh, they also have multiple cut color palettes, as is very in vogue nowadays with rebrands. So you have. Okay, I. I'm... I'm going to pretend that I'm showing off my mechanical keyboard. So you're going to hear some keystrokes. <laughs> Boom. Because um, I don't want to mute and then screw it up. Yeah, no, that, that's what? all good. Yeah, like that's what Intel needed, the new logo as opposed to, you know, yeah, you see, actual seven nanometer parts. Vlad, you see, this is why we needed you on a webcam so that we could see your facial expression reacting to the Intel logo thing. All we got was a gentle sigh and a very restrained reaction to the logo. Yeah, yeah. You, tell, you us, just tell, have us more, tell us more about how you feel. R remember, remember Jonathan Swan when he's interviewing Trump and Trump hands him a sheet of paper and he's like, huh? That, that's my... <laughs> It's, it's literally the same thing. It's literally the same thing. He's interviewing Trump, and he's like, what are you doing? People are dying. And Trump's like, no, 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 look, look, look. We, we're the best. We're the best. Look, it's in the piece of paper. And he's looking at it, and it's like an Intel logo. Where are the seven nanometer processors? Where are the performance improvements? Where's the freaking battery life? Why would I care about an Intel processor? Like, Apple is abandoning you guys. Do you realize how freaking in trouble you are well when apple starts putting its processors in imax next year 
Well, let's face it, uh, a lot of US tech companies are going to be facing the similar situations to uh, Intel in the coming years because of some anti-competitive uh, economic activities due to lobbying. Uh, it's not just Intel uh, who are struggling uh, in the new computing era. What do you think is going to happen to Qualcomm next? I'm sorry, no. no okay. The, the US-China competitive and competitiveness is valid. It is absolutely not an excuse for Intel. Intel has been screwing up since at least 2015 because if I noticed it and I'm only looking at consumer devices in 2015, it's bad, right? And it's been getting worse. They, they just do not, like, uh, their, the roadmap for them is the thing that is kind of like Brexit. Yeah, we, we're going to do it. We're going to complete it. It's just a little, a little bit more time, a little bit more time. Uh, so, sorry to hear on the sore spot. Uh, <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, in, Intel have been disappointing me for such a long time. And I'm somebody who, when my first PC, uh, like, at the turn of the century, you know, I would hear the Intel jingle and I'd be like, oh, yes, performance, speed, Pentium. I need that in my life. I need that in my PC. This is how my gaming career would be built on a, you know, on a base of Pentiums and NVIDIA GeForce graphics cards, right? Rock and roll. Um, but Intel has just been disappointing me for a long time. I don't, I don't actually foresee much in the way of, you know, things getting uh, in Qualcomm's way. Uh TSMC is a Taiwanese company, and they do the vast, uh, the vast majority of foundry work, right? So if you have a new chip and you want it built, it's TSMC or mostly Samsung. And bringing us back to NVIDIA, this was the impressive thing for me. Uh, Jensen Huang said that the NVIDIA, NVIDIA's latest graphics chips were their own, uh, even their own semiconductor design at 8 nanometers. Uh, which Samsung is doing. I don't know why he's disclosing that much detail. Like, literally, Samsung is our foundry partner, and they're building a custom chip design. Um, I guess just because he, he loves being a badass. Uh, but, yeah, so Samsung is there. Uh, the extreme ultraviolet lithography, which is the next stage for the most advanced, like, 5 nanometer, 3 nanometer uh, production manufacturing, those machines are be, being built by a company called ASML, which is based in the Netherlands, right? And they're US friendly. And then the people who are buying them and those machines cost like $150 million and like the size of, I don't know, a bus. Um, the people who are buying them are Samsung in Korea and TSMC in Taiwan. So the US can pick a really giant fight with China and it can still keep churning out its chips. Yeah, but what I'm what I'm trying to I'm say is Intel, no. what I'm what I'm trying to say is Intel has had little incentive to innovate at pace. They lost their hunger uh, because they had essentially won the desktop market in the mid two thousands and uh, from two thousand ten onwards. AMD wasn't much of a competitor, and there was no competitor coming from outside the US. So. In that era of desktop computing and server computing, Intel had no incentive to innovate. But now, with computing paradigms changing, mobile becoming more important, uh, I think that Intel's budget for lobbying uh, can still keep it going for a while. But uh, the big risk is that uh, some Chinese companies will start coming out with their own versions of x86 CPUs or even x64 CPUs to do their own thing. Uh, the China has been burnt badly by this trade war by that exact sort of behavior and they're going to mitigate that risk. Obviously not in the short term but they will have learnt their lesson and moved on on a 50-year plan to ensure it never happens again. And I have a feeling that's going to be the death knell not just for Intel but potentially AMD as well in the long term. In the short term, AMD can continue thripping reds, thri no, no, ripping threads and so forth. No, 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 this is great. <laughs> thripping reds is great. <laughs> thripping reds. But, okay, okay. But in the, et yeah, in the etymology of technology in 20 years' time, thripping reds can be re uh, re 
linked to this podcast. You're all part of it. Yeah. <laughs> a, a total Leo invention. Um, so this was a bit of a blue book terminal script for you. Um, China is preparing its 14th five-year plan. So not quite 50-year plan, but it's 14th five-year plan. Um, and you can mock it. You can be like, oh, look at those commies and their five-year plans. But you know what? That's better than freaking five-minute plan that the U.S. gets every five minutes, um, depending on the president's whims. Yes, or the, the corporate quarterly one. Um, yes, sometimes. Look, let, let's not throw every corporate under the bus. Uh, let, let's take our time and torture them first and make sure we pick uh, the good ones from the bad ones. Um, but part of their plan is going to be what's generally referred to as third generation semiconductors, which is you move away from silicon, you move away from just the general shrinkage to increase performance, and you use different materials. And what we're talking about here is things like uh, gallium nitride, which has already made its way uh, in portable batteries and chargers from the likes of Anchor. They've made battery and charger integrated into the same device, which is much smaller than previously. And those are, those are like the most sci-fi devices we have, but that's like just one application. But what China has in mind is like, we'll put this in self-driving vehicles, we'll put this in our nuclear rockets, we're going to do this, X, Y, and Z. And China can actually compete there because there isn't, like Matt was just saying, you know, decades and decades of built up advantage, which people can't surpass and can't catch up on. So it's really a case of like, you're not trying to beat Google with Google search because that already exists. You're like, how do we do the next thing? How do we get to the next form of discovery? Um, and it, that's where China is headed right now. Um, but once again, Intel has been sucking for a very long time. It deserves everything that it's going to get. And next year is going to be really fun when Apple switches over to its Apple Silicon. And then like all of a sudden MacBook battery life spikes up and everybody's like, oh, shoot. Let's um, let's get our shit together on Windows PCs and laptops. And then they're like, mm, maybe Intel isn't so great. And then, again, I'm coming back to Qualcomm. Qualcomm has all the opportunity in front of it because it's the leading um, ARM processor maker outside of Samsung, which has been struggling. Yeah, is, is anybody else? I mean, OK, so this is my frustration. I'm going to shut up and you know let you guys talk a bit. Huawei and its carrying processors were such great competitors because they fed into making the P40 and the Mate series so good and competitive against the iPhones. They gave them great battery life, great performance. They were leading the competition against Qualcomm and pushing for better 5G and so on and so on. And the US just assassinated that whole thing. Reactions. Yes. It's a sad state of affairs. I personally have been using Huawei P-series devices since the P6 in back in two, late 2013. Um, so that's been been, been a while. Uh, and whilst they weren't perfect, especially at the beginning, up till the, I would say, up till the P9, they were still a bit janky. But after the yep. P9, they took that step up in terms of performance and efficiency and i have to say i'm still i am now using a huawei p40 as one of my main devices and that kirin chipset is super efficient i really enjoy the jump up in performance on that device this isn't the p40 pro this is the sort of iphone 11 competitor but it is an amazing uh, chipset and it handles my photography needs very, very well. Not that you need a high-end chipset to do good photography. Um, I hear, Vlad, that you have a Pixel 4a. Uh, yeah, which I have not had the time to actually sit down and test. Um, but you I don't need a lot of computing still... power for, for your type of photography, do you? Even with all the night. Right, right. No, I mean... You have plenty. Uh, general mid-range processor will do you just fine for whatever sort of photography you want to do, unless you, you're trying to get on board with like the latest gimmicks like 8K video and blah, blah. I'm not interested in that. 
Um, I'm still sticking with the Pixel 4. Uh, I was, uh, I, I would say to people, if you just want to take the best possible photo and never think with it again, the iPhone 11 Pro is probably your best pick, actually, because it squeezes every last drop in terms of like image optimization. The JPEG processing on the iPhones, as, as much as you're going to get out of that lens and sensor, Apple gets you, right? The only way to upgrade it is you go uh, with like halide and you start shooting raw and then you start playing my game where you go into Lightroom and you tinker with it and a photo takes you three hours like it's a freaking, freaking Tech Travel Geeks podcast. <laughs> but yeah, so if you're not gonna play that game, get yourself an iPhone, you'll be, you'll be fine, you'll be happy. And this is the first time I've said that in, I don't know, five years. Uh, and part of that, again, is because Huawei has just been cut off from the market. Uh, can't always stress how ridiculous that is. Ironically, Huawei, in over the past quarter, became the world's biggest smartphone seller because of how many phones it's been able to sell in China. Like, all of its loss of U US market, which it never actually got to enter, and European market and so on, is just gained in China partially because of people feeling a bit patriotic because they're big companies being victimized by the American villains, but also because it's kicking ass, right? It, it has the best devices, probably has the best marketing reach and so on within the country. But we're looking at Huawei falling off a cliff because September 15th, everybody's effectively just completely cut off from them. We're talking even Qualcomm and MediaTek can't supply Huawei with chips because either they're an American company or they're working with American companies or they're working with companies working with American companies. It's just, it's just literally like whatever Huawei is stocked, stockpiled and we're kind of expecting it to launch its latest Mate series this month. That's basically it, right? It's got, it's got a, few, a few stockpiled chips. It's going to put them in its, in its Mate series. And unless somebody else gets elected to be US president and not only gets elected to be US president, but also decides to change policy, because that's not necessarily 100% given. Because Huawei smartphone business is kind of dead. I, I completely agree, because this Huawei thing is not really a Trump thing. This uh, movement and policy had already been in place under Obama's administration. This is uh, much more, I hate to say the words, in the space of the mandarins of government. Uh, in the sense that they are the people who actually, the civil servants, have made this decision and managed to convince whoever is officially the face of policy to make it happen. So it's a, it's a much deeper US uh, thing that has caused this trade war. Sadly, the, the outcome is that the average consumer will have less competition and the likes of uh, Qualcomm as well as MediaTek will have less competition to, to face up to. Lukash, uh, I'm, I'm, I can rant all night, so I, I need, I need you to give us some contributions. I, I feel bad. Uh, you... since, since Lukash has good, a, a Qualcomm eight six five plus, or is it eight five five plus chipset in the eight six five? So it's been a great, uh, great one. I've been using the Poco F two Pro uh, the last uh, month or so. Um, I tried the 8K and I agree it's not ready for prime time um, it, only, unless you keep it steady and not move and just use it to reframe. Uh, but you have to not move and keep it on a tripod. Um, then 8K is not, not needed at all. But um, yeah, uh, I've, been, I've been really enjoying the, the new Qualcomm uh, chipset, but it's even too fast for now. It's so much faster than most of my desktops from from the years past. So I just tried a few games recently and uh, yeah, I think we're, we're uh, approaching time when um, CPU power is too much for what, what we really need. And unless we jump somewhere with software, I'm not sure if we, how much uh, growth do we need right now? And do you have a 120 hertz uh, display on the Poco or is it 90? No, it's just 60. So 60. that's one thing I uh, I haven't experienced yet much. 
Um, because one of the rants that I uh, would gladly unload on anybody who asks is people need to chill out with the specs. Um, now that I've moved over to Asia, I have a lot of Indian followers and I love them all. I'm not uh, judging, but um, the tech culture uh, in my time zone is hyper focused on specs. It's kind of like uh, it's kind of like I don't know um, the way that it was in the West a few years back. Again, I'm, uh, it's really hard to say this without sounding like I'm generalizing heavily, but it, it's kind of the case. Like if, even when you look at Chinese companies making their promos, it's, it's all like 240 hertz touch sensitivity, 120 hertz screen, and we got. Um, screen accuracy with uh, just noticeable whatever it was the initialism um just noticeable color errors or something like that right and they're giving you some number like 0.003 and then it's like um our speakers can do x db of output and, and you just get lost in the sea of numbers and one of the things that I've gained in terms of perspective as I've pulled back from actually looking at every single device and having to write stories, breaking down every single spec, is that, no, they don't actually all matter, right? Like, Lucas is just telling us, this phone is it's like, it's almost too fast. Like, I have nothing to do to capture all of this capability and power within it. Um, is that a benchmark number? Is, is that a measurable? No, it's literally like you pick it up and you experience it. So we need to be, as reviewers and as enthusiasts in the way that we express ourselves, we need to get away from the numbers, right? So like somebody picking up the new Poco phone, somebody picking up the OnePlus Nord, I don't know if you guys have had experience with it, please let me know, I haven't. Um, just tell me how the bloody thing feels, right? Like this is the way that I used to review headphones as well. It's not show me the chart and then I, I'm looking at the basso and the alto frequencies. Oh my God. Um, I don't look at the numbers. I'm like, okay, let's put his headphones on me. And then like, does anything feel weird in terms of how they fit? Are they comfortable? Um, are, are there any pain points? Do my ears get sweaty? How are things? If they have noise canceling, do I hear like an electric hum and buzz and so on, right? You literally experience the damn thing. And then you look at numbers to try and understand what might be causing it. Like, it, oh, well, why is it so slow? And then you look at refresh rates or whatever, right? Um, and I think a lot of people, a lot of tech enthusiasts kind of have that flipped around, right? Because you don't have the device, you have the numbers first. So you start judging by the numbers before you get the experience. And I think we should flip them back around. So this is definitely something we agree on. and. Often I make a point of not uh, explicitly calling out metrics and numbers because it's all about the experience. I have had some exactly. top end smartphones with the Mac specs, but because of the way the device was put together and the software experience, it was a janky experience. I've had low end phones like the Xiaomi Redmi 9 that we unboxed earlier this week, which provide a much smoother and better experience than say some of the flagships out this year so I would I, I completely agree with the the spec race is really important especially for people who are looking to squeeze out the maximum value from their spending dollars or rupees or euros but in reality uh, we really need to move away from a spec based uh, experience uh, Apple have already done this, Samsung have done it for quite a few years now. They, they've pretty much stopped shouting out about specifications in their uh, keynotes. If you look at Apple's latest keynote, uh, they don't mention the RAM in the iPhone 11 Pro Max or the iPhone 11. It's just not something they shout out about. What they do tell well, you they is... Never actually, they, they never they specified the RAM. Yeah, but they, what they do is they, sh they tell us the model number of the chipset and how fast it is in comparison to previous experiences and how that feeds into the new experience. And Samsung, to be fair to them, have been doing the same with their recent unpacked events. It's not about the numbers for them anymore. And the, when they mentioned the 100 times zoom, everyone just laughed at them. And this year, the, the Note 20 Ultra doesn't mention the 
hundred X zoom anymore because it's not the the, the the fact that you can have a oil painting made with the hundred times zoom uh, camera doesn't make it a hundred times zoom camera. So yeah, th I think they they they're re relearning that that fact right now. Yes, uh, yeah, but that I mean, won't that won't stop you uh, using that uh, feature in the canals of Amsterdam, will it, Lukash? <laughs> I was just testing the camera. <laughs> yes, I'm sure you were. <laughs> but yes, the, uh, we let, let's all agree that we should move away from a spec-based uh, culture with regards to uh, consumer electronics and maybe focus a bit more on the overall experience. Yeah, I mean, and I think Matt, you 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 put it you put it nicely. Uh, the reason why the Indian market is much more sensitive to specs is because, as you actually said, it's much more price sensitive, right? And I, that's fair enough. But then I will still make the point: you want to get the best user experience. It, it isn't meaningful to you if you get x amount of extra RAM, which doesn't mean anything, right? If you get double or triple the resolution if it isn't uh, distinguishable by your eye, right? It isn't meaningful to you. And if you do want to make an investment, if you do want to plan ahead and be like, okay, well, I'm going to own this phone for a year, a year and a half, and then maybe sell it on. Sorry to keep it so simple, but then just get an iPhone, right? Because then you're thinking about resale value. And resale value isn't going to hold because you got an extra couple of gigs of RAM today. I, in a couple of years' time, the RAM is going to be double, and it doesn't matter if you need it. They're going to force it down your throat, and your upgrade today because you're trying to future-proof is meaningless. So don't bother. Don't don't bother to try and you know uh, forecast uh, things that are just going to keep growing and growing for no no particular reason. Um, but yes, if you want to make an investment, if you want to think about resale value, iPhone universally globally. It resells X number of times uh, better than Android devices. It's just a fact of life. Yes. Can can I, can I have a short rant and really complain about smartphone manufacturer manufacturers, including completely pointless macro lenses on their devices? Because we mentioned Are OnePlus Nord. Yes. So everyone is putting these pointless two or five megapixel macro sensors on their smartphone cameras and it's just a waste of space and time no one uses them and even if you try and use them it's pointless it really is frustrating uh, I can say that from personal experience with the OnePlus Nord with the Xiaomi Redmi uh, 9 with uh, what was the oh the Nokia 5.3 that we recently reviewed on the Tech Travel Geeks YouTube channel these are made for specs conscious markets where four cameras is better than three but in practical use even with two soft light boxes i can't use that macro camera and have anything near as good as what i get from the main sensor hmm. well to today i learned that it is really really frustrating and i understand they're doing it because they can say hey the iphone may have two cameras the one you can afford, that's uh, the iPhone 11, but we're putting in four cameras, and so it must be good. It's like, once upon a time, if it had a blue LED, it must be good, because it's better than a green one. I mean, personally, I'm a, I'm a red, um, red LED, red politics kind of guy. Uh, <laughs> so you, <laughs> but, uh, you, you would fit right in in China where red is the yeah. equivalent of green here. So if you go to the Chinese stock market and you see a screens full of red, that means that uh, the market overall is going up. Are you, are you pulling my leg? Because I've never been in China and now I don't know no, the, if the, I should believe the, you. The Shanghai Stock Exchange uh, has the color connotation that if it's red, that means that prices are going up. At least it was the last time I was in Shanghai. Is, is, is it blue on a minus when things are supposed to go down? I'm not aware. I think it's blue or green or depending on the on the context. Wow, I mean, th this is like 
I've just learned two brand new things in the space of three minutes. I should, I should probably just <laughs> shut up and let Matt keep ranting. Yes, and I, I agree with you, Vlad. Uh, the 90 hertz or 120 hertz is irrelevant in my opinion. It's nice to have, but what's the trade-off? I would much spend, much rather that money be spent on maybe more battery or a slightly more durable shell of a smartphone that lasts longer than this high refresh rate screen which to me personally says little or nothing. I know our friend Miriam loves her high refresh rate smartphones. She scrolls through Gmail at high speed but uh, I have to say it's one of those things that I can't really uh, get on board with. Much the same as those macro cameras. Doom scrolling at 120 frames a second. <laughs> Yes. But okay, let's let let's not be doom saying and they saying right now. I, I think uh, a, a techie podcast that whinges about manufacturers is nobody's uh, you know flavor right now. We we need to cheer the people up. Um, let's give some cause for optimism. There are a couple of devices that have uh, caught my eye. First of all, there's the Galaxy ZZ Fold Two. Um, I think we need to give Samsung a bit of credit. Not too much, not too much. Um, because they learned, right? The the original Z Fold, I'm, I'm calling it Z because I chatted with a Brit and he called it Z. And I'm like, yeah, finally someone, someone you know, using the Z. So we're going to go with that. The original Z Fold, it had many shortcomings. The exterior screen didn't know whether it was like a flip screen mini device screen or if it was like a small but fully functional screen. Now it's basically more or less a fat smartphone when it's closed, right? So you have a full smartphone size display on the outside. Then you open it up, it's pretty squarish and all the fat bezels and chunks and you know things protruding have been ironed out and it's slick on the inside. I haven't touched it myself. I haven't seen it in person, but you know I've seen the images like everyone else. And the real major upgrade is um, Samsung is now using ultra thin glass. And the difference between the plastic that was the first generation foldable devices versus ultra thin glass, I think is going to be the thing that makes these new devices compelling. It's going to be the thing that makes the difference between, wait, you, you charge me $2,000 and the screen's made out of plastic. So if I sneeze on it, like the particles from my sneezing are going to scratch the damn thing, right? It's that sensitive to scratches. Or if not that, then the hinge is wide open, so they're gonna get in and like choke up the hinge or whatever. It, it was so so fluid, and I have been disappointed by all the first generations. Well, Huawei Mate X again was nice, but again, Huawei, uh, you know, rest in peace. Um, but the Fold Two it fixes so many things. It, it learns, you know. It's Samsung showing that it learned, like. People complain about the hinge. Samsung went and fixed the hinge and now it has apparently a sweeper mechanism on the inside, which like when you twist it and turn it, it literally like pushes things out and it has covers for the hinge. So dust will probably not spoil either the display or the hinge with this device. Um, it seems like the crease in the middle is even fainter. They made the screens bigger. They, they improved, right? They upgraded things. They put 5G in there. It's still a $2,000 device. It's still not a thing that most of us should even be thinking about, except for optimistically thinking about how people like TCL, which showed a bunch of prototypes of foldables back at MWC last year, are working on the same sort of thing, but at a much cheaper price, right? So now Samsung is putting this thing out there. Like, do you know who the first people to buy a Z Fold 2 are going to be? freaking Chinese companies, and then they go and reverse engineer the crap out of it. They're doing like tech ana anatomy. Um, no, not, not, well, not anatomy, but what, what do you do with their bodies? Dichotomies? Help me out. No, you don't dichotomize their bodies. <laughs> um, Lullaby? Come on, guys. <laughs> I know what you mean. Retro no, engineer like, is, is the fact, word I would use. Reverse engineering, yes, but I mean physical human dead bodies. You get one in, and you want to learn about human human anatomy, and then you what's the verb? Dissection. 
dissect. Yeah, yeah, I guess. There's, not, there's nothing specific to cadavers, but you know, my excuse is it's past eleven o'clock on a Friday night, so uh, yes. my vocabulary is slimming down. Speaking of the time and where you are in Tokyo, uh, one thing you you mentioned in our Telegram chats is that since moving to Japan, you've acquired a taste for coffee. Oh yeah. So tell us about the coffee you have in Japan. What is it that won you over? Oh well, the first part was uh, the cans, uh, and you, you you're probably thinking, what the hell do cans have to do with coffee? Well, Japan has canned coffee, and it has steel cans, and they are textured, and they're just beautiful. I'm talking uh, so Kirin Black Fire. First of all, it's a brand, and like. I'm intrigued. Tell me about it. I don't care if you're a band. I don't care if you're like a brand of bicycle. Tell me more about the Kirin Blackfire. And they're just like really gorgeous. These mini cans are like 120 grams. And I was just like playing around with one. And they're heavy, right? Because they're steel. They're like everything I've known in terms of canned drinks in Europe has been, well, first of all, crappy drinks in aluminium. And then I pick up this heavy steel can. I'm like, okay, look, the, the can is so good. The contents, I got to try them, right? I got to sample them. So I try them. And it's really good coffee. This is the thing. The vending machine coffee in Japan is really, really freaking good and really cheap. It's 100 yen, which equates to 60 or 70 pence. And you get a can of just high quality, usually, usually cold coffee, but that's good because... The weather here is just light years ahead of the UK, okay? It's been a humid <laughs> summer, but, like, we get warmth, right, guys? We get sunshine. We get reasons to want to have a cool drink in the winter. And then there's when vending machines serving hot drinks anyway, so you're covered either way. So it started that, that way. Um, so started doing that, felt good, got into other ones. The other thing with me is, listen, I started doing headphone reviews because somebody put a freaking more powerful amp in the HC1 and 9. And I was like, okay, I'm a smartphone reviewer. What does a more powerful amp mean? And it's like, let me review one pair of headphones and it became like 300. So it's kind of the same thing with coffee. So now, I, now I'm more like, ask me about it, right? <laughs> I'm literally like 11 months into coffee, but I can tell you things. I can be like, okay, so Colombian is more like chocolatey, nutty, bitter flavor, and Ethiopian has more of a fruity thing going on. Uh, right now, I'm really high on Guatemalan coffee because I got an amazing one in this uh, place in Ginza. Uh, because, guys, Tokyo, if you want to be really, really, really picky about anything, Tokyo's got you covered. If you want to be like, I want the best goddamn whiskey in the world, Tokyo's got all the specialist whiskey places and all the specialist cocktail places where you can just say like, I'm in the mood for some sort of vibe and they'll put together a cocktail recipe for you and it will blow your mind, right? Coffee places over here are just like super high end. And again, mostly affordable, right? It's not, it's like a, it's like a little luxury for you to have in your life. Um, so there's all of that stuff. Every appliance that I bought for my apartment has been amazing. Uh, Panasonic's domestic stuff versus its international stuff. Uh, like everything just freaking works and it's perfect. Like I've had the best fridge of my life is here in Tokyo. The best kettle, Tokyo. I got a tiger kettle. It's just better. Like, I'm sorry, it just, everything... In terms of like consumer goods and staples <laughs> and experiences, I some things are going to be expensive. Uh, clothes, watches, you know, rent. Plenty of things are expensive here in Tokyo. But once you pay your money, you get a hundred percent reassurance. Like you, you can actually. When I was in the UK, or oh God, when I was in Bulgaria, three times as much. You kind of have to be on your guard when you're buying things, right? It's like you hire a guy to do some construction work for you or you take your car in for repair and the guy will be like, oh, oh, ooh, mm, you got you got to fix this other thing. And, you know, your whole engine is kind of on the fret, so maybe we should swap that out. You know, you go in to change your tires and then you get a whole new car. 
because it's how you you, you got to stack on these other things. I had um, I, w I went into the store called Tokyo Bike. They literally make bikes and they're a Tokyo company. So they're like, we'll call ourselves Tokyo Bike. They have a London outlet and some international US as well. And I was like, um, let me go in and check if I need to swap my tires. And first of all, the guy saves me half the price by telling me, you don't need to swap your front tire. It still has enough tread for another year. Uh, we'll just swap your rear one if you like. So I'm like, okay, cool. Let's do that. So he saves me half the price there. Then when I'm paying, I still don't pay much attention to um, uh, the banknotes. And unlike the UK, where you can definitely tell the difference between like a five or a 50 pound note, the ones here are pretty close. So I handed the guy a 10,000 yen note where I thought it was a 1,000 yen note. And I'm like, I've given you enough, but he keeps pushing them back to me. And I'm like, well, I was like, I've given you as much as you need. And he keeps handing back to me. And then I realized he wanted to hand the 10,000 back because I was overpaying by like 5,000 or whatever. So yeah, that's that's a real difference. Uh, quality of service. Um, and just knowing that other people are not going to defraud you and all these other things. That being said, if you screw up even a little bit, they will get you and they will gut you, right? <laughs> so, so, so this is the other thing. It is not an ethical thing here in Japan, right? We, we're, we're, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to go with this uh, rant. It's Tech Travel Geeks podcast, so I'm perfectly in my right to do this. Definitely. We want is to it, know more, more about, about Japan so that we can start planning our future travel, uh, hopefully in 2021. Please, I shall welcome you. I should be your host. It is not an ethical thing. It is not a uh, everybody's better. Everybody is somehow more committed to social cohesion. It's literally easier for you to do the right thing here, right? Because people will be like, dude, WTF are you doing? Get in line. Like there is social pressure. And honestly, I don't, I'm not going to say that it is 100% positive. Um, it can be overwhelming. I know people who, Japanese people who move to more Western areas, areas where you're going to have more immigrants, uh, just to kind of get a bit of relief, right? Because it, like you've got to be in the straight and narrow, you've got to be in the straight and narrow all the time, and it can become overwhelming. Uh, so there's pluses and minuses to it. On the one hand, people are specializing their jobs, and when they come to do a service or produce a product, they will give you the best freaking product. On the other hand, um, I would prefer that everybody's kind of like me, where they do it out of choice rather than feeling socially pressured to do it. I mean, I don't even know that I necessarily do it out of choice. Like if you tell me take a bad photo and then publish it, or like um, as an editor, allow a typo through. Like for example, okay, here's a really good example. On the Bloomberg terminal, the rule is the first letter of a proper noun is going to be capitalized and we don't care if it's an iPhone or if it's an iPad. Do you know what my heart goes through when I have to publish a story with capital Y, capital P in the headline for iPhone? Oh. Like it hurts I, I would me. Say, I, I would say that is a, the right thing to do personally. But then again, I love capitalization and I have a certain dislike for the... Uh, lowercase branding uh, that Apple uses in its brands. Well, we, we disagree on that point. And, and it's just, um, Plain yeah, so, so but, but, uh, like the point I'm trying to make, the, the, the cultural point I'm trying to make is that I still feel like I can go and be a joke to people if I feel the need, right? I feel like somebody can be rude enough to me to where I'm like, okay, I will civil with you up until that point and then you overstep the boundary, and now I can just unload on you verbally, right? Not physically. I'm a nonviolent person. Japanese people just don't, it, it feels like, I'm sure they have boundaries too, but it feels like it's so far out. Like they'll be polite to you until you, you know, it's, it's too much, right? And I, I would prefer that they trim those back and when they have disagreements they would express them more readily 
pretty much well not not as readily as i would right because lukash is an eastern european he knows eastern europeans have a much shorter fuse than western europeans so you don't need to be bulgarian tier um ready to disagree and argue but i feel like japan in general would benefit from just a little bit less politeness a little bit more forthrightness in expressing oneself um which might also help the country's low birth rate hint hint <laughs> So how how is your how are your adventures in Tinder in Tokyo? Oh, I I, I don't do Tinder. Okay then, sorry. Uh, um, but yes, it's which, which it, means dating life <laughs> because <laughs> that's literally if you don't speak Japanese and you don't do dating apps, you're screwed, right? So uh, my life is cycling around the city editing scoops about the tech supply chain and editing photos. I'm not really complaining about it right now. Uh, I have friends like you guys to keep me socially stimulated, but ultimately I'm going to have to figure something out on that front as well. So if you had to choose between learning Japanese and using a dating app, which one would you choose? Let, uh, let's take it back. Let, let, let's define this as a binary option. <laughs> It's binary option, fair enough, uh, and I know where you're getting, what you're getting into. Um, but those are two very different timelines. It's like, how soon do you want to get laid? Is really the question, right? Because <laughs> like, are you going to learn entire languages? Maybe not. Um, and the reason you get into binary, and uh, let's um, enlighten Lukash about this, is um, I was offering you an option, and. Um, and it was a, a yes or no option. <laughs> and you said, oh, it's a restricted binary option. I'm like, yes, 50% of a binary choice. That's our special <laughs> offer. Okay, okay. Exactly. So, but um, to, to, to go back to it, uh, to what we're saying about dating apps, so language is obviously going to be a, a slightly longer timeline to, to, to complete. Just one word of warning, even if you're, especially if you're using an Android device or the Google Play, uh, when you type Tinder into the Google Play search bar, uh, be very, very careful about autocorrect, because a while back I was a guest on, on a show called All About Android on Twit TV, and one of the segments of the show is called the Android App Arena. You get to choose an app that you take in and face off in a voting battle with the other hosts and guests on the show. And so I I took it on as a personal challenge to try and take Tinder into the app arena. But uh, I failed miserably. Candice was tutting at me furiously and I really had no need for the app. So I, I didn't do it in the end. But what I'm trying to say is if you type Tinder into the Google Play uh, search bar, the Gboard uh, keyboard as well as Microsoft Swift key will try and autocorrect that to Timber. And if you search for Timber on on uh, the Google Play Store, you'll get a lot of apps for people who have wood. And literally, I mean, uh, you have a lot of apps which are lumber and timber calculators, which is apparently a need many people have, is to calculate uh, the type of wood they're using for construction and more importantly its cost. So Tinder, Timber, two very different things. Jokingly they could be directly related. I, I thought that's where you were going with this. But yeah, People so have wood. They, they do. Um, but Timber and Tinder, uh, they're, they're quite funny. So let us know. Uh, it would be fun to see uh, your insights into, as a, as a discerning technology user, into dating apps. See what you think about the whole thing, especially knowing that you have some very strong feelings about social media signals and companies. Yeah, I, I'm seeing a red battery signal on your video, Matt. Oh yes. Something that must be my camera trying to say that it's time for us to start wrapping up the, the podcast. <laughs> you should get a battery, a permanent battery for your camera matter. I, I should, yes. Um, but then again, my desktop setup will be changing quite drastically soon. I too mm. am on the market for a high-end uh, PC for video and photo editing. 
Uh, for photo editing I'm fine with my laptop for now, but uh, I will be uh, looking for a different setup which will involve changing the camera setup as well. Okay, so, so let me unload one, one final rant and it's... <gasps> Matt's gone. Um, well, his video's gone, so maybe... You still with us, Matt? Can I hear you? Woohoo. Okay. We, we got the Christmas jumper. The jumper, Matt. No sound. I, I guess the sound was wired via um, the camera as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if we're still recording even. But okay, so I'll, I'll do this anyway. I'll, I'll, I'll fill the space. The last time I was with you guys, when we did the free hour podcast, um, and we're talking about travel, and I said Japan would be a really kick ass place to go and to visit and to be a tourist. And as far as Tokyo is concerned, um, I think it was 100% right. It's still an amazing place, and I'm still, you know, just scratching the surface of exploring it. And then there's the bonus once, you know, travel uh, restrictions ease up and um, it's just easier to get around the country. Going to places like Kyoto and the countryside, Mount Fuji, I still, I still haven't been to that. Um, and I think the thing that I'm going to do uh, soonest is probably go to Kyoto because the tourists are still not allowed. So it's mostly going to be just locals and yourself and your camera. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a fun thing to do. But I, ju I just remember that podcast fondly because it was it was literally like, I don't really care to be going as a tourist many other places. Right, because right now I, I miss Bulgaria. There, there are people in Bulgaria that I want to spend time with, and um, it still feels like my distant home. So it's nice to go and revisit places. Mm -hmm. uh, but aside from that, um, Japan is still, you know, geographically and you know, as a place to learn and explore. Uh, the place I, I'm happy with. But let me ask you, how, how do you feel about Poland? How do you feel about uh, going back when you do? Yeah, I've not been to Poland in uh, in more than a year now. Uh, I know, since uh, since Christmas time, I think, so this year. And my sister uh, had a wee girl in February, and I didn't, didn't have a chance to meet her yet. And so she oh. now she's not seven months old, uh, and I, I haven't met her. And my godson is is uh, getting close to three years old, and I've not seen him in a in a good few months. So I'm really looking forward to travel. Uh, my parents are back in Poland, so I'd be keen to uh, to see them. Um, so I have to wait until this um, whole thing ends, and we can we can get back to traveling. And once that's that's done, uh, and one, once I've visited my family, uh, yeah, Tokyo is very high on my list. Uh, as well as o Osaka, uh, I, I always wanted to go there. Is it worth? Have you been there? I don't know. That's the point. I've, I've been like, uh, it's like I've, I've restricted my travels to within Tokyo just because it's so freaking big that there's, mm -hmm. there's always something closer than the other thing uh, that you can explore. Mm -hmm. um, but uh yeah so i'm i'm is it, well I, I mean you can travel to poland now right uh i could i probably would have to self isolate definitely when i'm back uh yeah for two weeks stay home which i already do anyway so i just have to have some more uh, deliveries uh i could i could travel if i wanted to but i choose not to uh i could have gone to berlin to ifa 2020 probably but no there's no i i'd rather not do that uh, right now i'd yeah. rather be safe uh safe than sorry so i totally agree can you hear me yeah. i mean i i hadn't missed an efa until last year last year was the first efa i had missed in a decade or more and guess what i missed nothing <laughs> Like, there was no massive product launch. There was no massive news where it's like, oh, snap. I should have been there to cover it live. Yeah. And the funny thing is, every time that I go, you put in a week's worth of work, man. It's just back to back to back, photos, videos, write-ups, 
device after device. And that, that's actually like the, the big change again, becoming an editor and taking more of a backseat. Um, I can have more of a perspective on things and I don't need to fixate on company X's latest product because this is the other thing. Companies, their, their PR and marketing departments work for months mm -hmm. to just consume your attention. Right, so when you go to a trade show like IFA or better examples like Mobile World Congress, CES, they're concerned with getting the maximum amount of your time, not the maximum efficient amount of your time. It's like, okay, I am here, I have product A, it's the only thing that I'm pushing, and I need, uh, just like Matt was saying about YouTube, how many hours views do you have it's not how many viewers you have it's how many hours you have viewed so they're kind of the same way uh probably i don't know how many minutes and hours of journalist time have i occupied with my product a that's that's their mission and when you get a hundred of these people and they're constantly trying to just consume your time consume your time because from their perspective i mean put yourself in their shoes right like if you consume an entire day of my time can i cover your competitors during that time? <laughs> Can I do anything other than think about your stupid product A? I think that's the main reason why why this is happening, so that you can focus on theirs and not the others. Yeah. But yeah. So it's actually good to miss out on some trade shows, uh, whether because of the coronavirus or because, in my case, I've traveled you know, 9,000 kilometers away to a faraway land. And then it turns out that, yeah, we can still, we can still do things without the trade show. There's a, I think a lot of companies and industries even are realizing this. And that, that's another thing about Japan. People still doing business by fax. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> um, if you look at the Bloomberg Terminal, you will see, especially in, uh, in Japanese news, um, some of our breaking news headlines, it will be like fax from X, Y, and Z they've made an announcement. So like, how do you make it official? Yeah, we'll put it for the fax. Now it's an official announcement. The stock market knows because we faxed it. So th does that mean the fax becomes the new official form? Of, well, it is the, still the official form of communication, much like no, it used to no. be you had to have a piece of paper with a signature and a blue pen in some places. Oh, that's, 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 that's still a thing. You have um, your stamp. So most people have their own personalized stamp. And when they sign anything, they sign off on anything, you have to stamp the documents with your stamp. Um, they allow you to have a hand signature, but, but it, it has to be really precise. It's not like the way that we sign for like deliveries, right? It's just Bleh. Yeah, like I just signed stuff, right? It's fine. Yeah, no. Um, so, that was actually one of the issues when people had to, uh, you know, do social distancing and get get away from the office. It was just the fact that you do have to go in and fax stuff in order to communicate, and you do have to stamp documents in order to get business done. Uh, so a lot of people were complaining about that. But again, looking at the upside, a lot of companies actually realized something that they would never have tested themselves are too conservative. Oh. So our employees, they stay at home, but they have computers, they can connect to the network and they can see productive. And that turned out to be correct. So companies, uh, several of the large Japanese companies are saying, we'll do half our workforce work from home from now on, just like permanently. We're good with it. It's fine. It's cheaper. Let's go. So, uh, Vlad, that's really interesting insights into Japan and your rants. Now, I'm hoping that <laughs> in the next few moments, we shall have uh, my uh, Vivaldi tab on screen, and you should yep. be able to see that. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. So you've been doing some amazing work in Lightroom and with your pictures uh, on social media, specifically on Twitter. You're sharing a lot of really great content. Uh, Give us some insights into where these pictures were taken. How did you get that view of the park in the center of Tokyo? I believe that's where it is, uh, with that sky. Okay, so the sky I needed to talk to Zeus about. So that's on the big guy, right? 
Um, uh, the sky is uh, my Lightroom preset. And I will say this, August sunsets, especially, are the pinkest ones that I've noticed. And I don't think they're exclusive to Japan. It's just Japan actually has them as opposed to the UK where the sun just goes away and never bothers with a sunset. It's just like, okay, we'll no more light now. Bye. Um, sorry to him in the UK, but it really is just atrocious weather. Humans should not exist in that country. Um, <laughs> if you can't grow wine, it is not good for growing humans. That's my rule. But Vlad, the UK has such good wines now. Um, I think one of the ones that uh, comes to mind is the Kent, uh, Kent Champagne or Kent, Kent uh, Sparkling White, also known as Brexit Champagne. Uh, it is actually quite good. Candice and I picked up a bottle at Costco a while back, and it, the UK is, is starting to get quite good at wine. It's only taken them a few hundred years. Um, my reaction right now... Do you remember that gif of the blonde lady who, who's like, uh, I think, drinking something or reacting to something? And at first she's like, oh, no, 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 no. And then, and then she raised an eyebrow and she's like, hmm, maybe? And it's like, nah, nah, that's can't even come true. <laughs> that's my reaction to what you're saying about British wine. Dude, I'm fine. I, I, I'll take French, Greek, Italian, Bulgarian, Australian, New Zealandish. Californian and so on before I even dabble with uh, British. <laughs> if you want to talk whiskey, you can, but that's like a whole other business. Yes, there's um, a whole other business that Japan is very good at. I have recently finished a white oak uh, Japanese uh, whiskey, which is beautiful. Yeah. They're good, man. The people are good. They also do really good beef, as you might know. Um, Wagyu. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I, Lukas and I had uh, some beautiful Wagyu Dons in uh, Singapore, which were were marvelous. I, I like to think of it as a religious experience, as someone not religious. Yeah, it was beautiful. But yeah, so your Tokyo, your Tokyo adventures in photography and mobile photography specifically and Lightroom are really Im impressive and, more importantly, inspirational. So mm. keep it up, Vlad. Keep on sharing, uh, and we'll hopefully be able to catch up with you more on that. Would you like to do a dedicated podcast to ha ha talk about your uh, photo mobile photography and editing workflow? Well, no, because that, that's proprietary information okay. um but yeah we, if, no i'm on the, on the one serious note i would love to talk um to a whole podcast just about mobile photography i think i think uh uh it's a fascinating thing it's uh for me it's a form of personal therapy because i can just you know sink my mind into a photo and just um disconnect um i mean i don't know how closely you guys are tied into the news but it's my job and uh the trouble with twitter is you know you 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 close down all your work tabs and whatever else and it's, it's still there there's still news happening there's still people getting shot in america and just all this wildness happening and sometimes it's good you know you just put on some chill out music um are you guys familiar with hang drums by the way no what's that hang drums uh so they are uh, metal drums uh with some indents and uh, a lot of people ha just have them kind of sitting in their lap and cool. wherever you tap on it it creates a different sound and it just looks i know it's not easy but it looks so easy like you, you can start making cool sounds by yourself without having much skill which is the complete opposite of a guitar, right? Because I've tried learning to play the guitar, and it's literally you're an idiot at the guitar for the first, I don't know, two months or something, right? Whereas these hang drums, they're really cool, they're really chill, and they produce all sorts of notes. Um, and, yeah, so you can have some of that in the background, and it's perfect. Like, you can fall asleep to that music. It's super chilled out. That, a bit of photo editing, like, 
it beats therapy, honestly. Oh, well. For sure. We'll definitely need to look into that. Do you have any YouTube music uh, playlist to share with us on that on that note? I have an ambient music uh, playlist, but um, I don't really care to share. Fair enough. People can just do their own. I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. There's a lot of 70s Japanese jazz, you know, the sort of stuff that inspired Cowboy Bebop soundtrack that people just need to get into. Like um, the instrumentals, the ambience, 70s, 80s, 90s Japanese music. There's, there's some um, ambient sounds from forests that uh, a Japanese artist has produced. Just freaking put that into the YouTube search panel. You will have your mind expanded. And let's not also forget that all famous uh, mid 90s uh, Japanese band, uh, the equivalent of Blur in the UK, known as Bokeh. <laughs> Sorry, terrible joke. <laughs> oh, my <mother. laughs> God. Yeah, I'm speechless. I'm speechless because I wasn't, I wasn't really sure. <laughs> so, so on that terrible joke and ref no, musical no, you, reference, you, you can't you can't sign off on that. <laughs> you can't sign off on that. Now well, I'm going to speak up like a whole new subject. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we can talk about it the next time you're on the podcast, Vlad. It would be a pleasure to have you back to talk about mobile photography and uh, compare some notes. Uh, I I think that. On the subject of mobile photography, it would good to be good to introduce you to our friend Ant Pruitt, uh, who mm. is based in California and is really into photography. He's he's a really he's a master who simplifies and explains to his audience, and who I've been on a few photo walks with. I think uh, it would be great to have you and Ant on to talk about mobile photography at some point. But in the meantime, what's your Twitter handle. Where can people follow you on Twitter? Um, at Vlad Savo. Um, that's pretty much my centralized place where people can pick up the other threads. Uh, they can reach me on Telegram if they have scoops. My day job is still in technology news. So, uh, yeah, if anybody wants to buy a Bloomberg Terminal subscription on my account, please do. And then just message michael bloomberg so he knows that you got a subscription because of me I, i'm that sure that the refer the referral uh bonuses are, are important ah oh, they're immense they're immense um <laughs> uh yeah and and my photos you can get the full resolution of them on a website called kofi and i should do a bit of promo for that website because i really like it the reason i use it is because i like it it's like patreon where you can support people but unlike Patreon, it has no fee. So the way that it gets its um, funding at all is when creators pay for like a gold package, quote unquote gold package, where they can modify things, customize things. And once they get more of an audience, there are just, you know, perks. So the fee that goes from you as a supporter to a creator is only trimmed by PayPal. Who are just villains okay they take like 10 percent from that it's ridiculous but setting aside paypal kofi takes no money so the relationship between supporter and um, creative person is pretty much pure so to speak and it is run by a guy named nigel pickles so he's based in asia but he's from the uk so that's a bit of national pride for the island that i said shouldn't exist um yeah so Kofi, ko fi com slash Vlad S is where you can find me. Okay, so and just to you... so it's Vlad S, because uh, if you type Vlad yes. Savov, your Twitter handle, into the address bar, it redirects to co-fi.com slash Vlad S, yeah. which yeah. is great. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, yeah, you, you can go there. You can do the quote-unquote buy me a coffee thing. And then that gets you a month's access to all of my full resolution photos, which frankly is a steal. Uh, so don't steal my photos. <laughs> uh, just enjoy them. 
she's in German. So yeah, that's my repository online where people get the full resolution. Uh, on Twitter is where you get smaller uh, downscale resolutions as well as some uh, complaints about capitalism and its ills. Excellent. So how about you, Lukash? Uh, yeah, I'm El Suliga on uh, Twitter. I'm on YouTube on Tech Travel Geeks, uh, obviously. So just about to release the uh, full review of the uh, Poco F2 Pro long-term review. So um, took took a while to prepare that. So if you if you want to watch it, please do. Um, other than that, yeah, um, I'm on Instagram, but I don't use it, so I won't even promote it here. How about you, Mateo? So um, I'm Todoleo, T-O-D-O-L-E-O, on Twitter. And uh, if you want to check out the videos Lukash and I work on, that's the Tech Travel Geeks YouTube channel, where this episode of the Tech Travel Geeks podcast is, as well as um, on Adobe Stock. So unlike Vlad, I do not offer all my back catalogue of edited pictures available uh to Kofi subscribers, I monetize heavily as a dirty capitalist uh, on Adobe Stock. So you can spend 99 cents and have a full resolution version of my picture. Or if you subscribe to Adobe Stock, you can get the images as part of your subscription. But I think that's everything from us. Tech Travel Geeks on YouTube is where to see most of our content. Uh, over the course of uh, the rest of this summer, we're going to be kickstarting our website coverage with some key contributions about travel from our friend who, last time we had her on the podcast, was from Tokyo. Um, our friend Laura, who has been on some travels as well. But for now, uh, I would say, Vlad, again, thank you for joining us, and we will have you back on soon to talk more about uh, mobile photography and deconstructing capitalist society. But thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you. Thank you for indulging my rants. And if you need to edit out anything incriminating, please do. I definitely will, but I don't think there's any need to. Uh, also because uh, it's a much shorter episode than the last one. If you haven't already, please <laughs> do watch episodes 22 of the Tech Travel Geeks podcast, which is only available on YouTube. It's a three and a half hour special. <laughs> It's the is the Lord of the Tech Rings extended extended edition. Yes, the, the, the when, when the light goes down and down and it gets darker in Vlad's room, that was just epic. So it, it, <laughs> it's it's a bit like the 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 Japanese Zack Snyder cut. Oh god! <laughs> right, I'm going to stop the recording now. To our friends on YouTube, uh, to all seven concurrent viewers, thank you for watching through this episode of the Tech Travel Geeks podcast. You can catch up with the full edited episode on our RSS feed soon. But for now, thanks for watching and goodbye from us.